Thank you for joining us today for Introduction to Apache Tomcat 7 with Mark Thomas, staff engineer for VMware. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mark Thomas. Amy, thank you very much indeed. So the agenda for this afternoon, we're going to go through a quick introduction and then look at each of the major specifications that are implemented in Tomcat 7 in turn. So we'll look at servlet, then JSP, then expression language. We'll then move on to look at some of the other new features that are in Tomcat 7, over and above those that are in the specifications. And we'll finish up with some references to some useful resources, and we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions. So to start with, a little bit of my background. I'm a committer on the Apache Tomcat project. I've been doing that for about six years, and I'm also a member of the Tomcat Project Management Committee. So let's have a look at the uh, new features that are available in the Servlet 3 specification. The first one is the asynchronous processing. Prior to Servlet 3, request and response processing was always synchronous. What that meant was when processing started, a thread was allocated to that request response pair, and it stayed allocated to it all the way through until that response was completely written out to the client. Now, that could lead to um, some inefficiencies, I mean, particularly if you're, you process the request and then you identify that you need to go to some external resource to do some additional processing, and that additional resource is going to take a reasonable amount of time. And reasonable amount of time will depend on, on circumstances, but it could be sort of tens of seconds. Prior to Servlet 3, whilst the request was waiting for that external resource to complete, the thread would just be sat there not doing anything. It would essentially be blocked. What asynchronous processing lets you do is actually just park the request and go and let that thread go and do some useful work elsewhere, and it will come back to it, or another thread will come back to it, but potentially, and finish off processing the request and response once the additional information is available. So it gives you an opportunity to use your threads more efficiently. Now, in order to use these features, it does mean that all of the filters and all of the servlets in the processing chain must support asynchronous processing. The exception to that is if you do asynchronous processing, and then once you've finished with the asynchronous processing, you can dispatch to a synchronous servlet or JSP in order to generate the remainder of the response. So, well, we are, yes. Uh, processing chain and so all your filters and servlets in the processing chain need need to as I say support asynchronous processing. Now the sort of typical uses of this might be a, a stock ticker, a, a progress indicator, it might be as an interface to some web services. So lots of different things you can do with it. The next feature is web fragments and annotations. The idea here is that if you're using a framework like the Spring Framework or Struts or, or something similar, and prior to Servlet 3, if you wanted to use that framework, you'd include the jar file in the WebInf lib directory, and then you'd also have to make some changes to the web.xml, usually to configure a listener or map a servlet or some other configuration. What web fragments let you do is include that information within the framework jar. So potentially the Spring Framework or Struts or any, any other framework could include the necessary configuration within a metainf web fragment.xml and then Tomcat 7 will read that when it starts and it will merge it into the overall web.xml for the application. So you can actually have multiple jar files, each with their own web fragments and they'll all get merged into the into the overall application web.xml. Now there are various rules on ordering and things you can do to control that, and it is possible um, to set up a configuration where you can't actually meet the ordering requirements, and if that happens, then the application just won't start. In addition to web fragments, there's also a number of new annotations that are supported. For servlets, filters, and listeners, this lets you annotate any class in a JAR file, um, as a servlet filter or listener, and then that will also get included into the web application's overall configuration. 
the downside with this is it does mean that every single class in the application has to be scanned when Tomcat 7 starts. So that does slow down the startup considerably. But I'll show you in a second a way that you can avoid that particular problem. Other annotations are there for security and file upload, and they're placed on servlets and they're only scanned when the servlet is loaded. Now, both fragments and annotations give rise to security concerns, and additionally, annotations do give rise to those performance concerns I was just talking about. The security concern is that if you wanted to use a, um, say you wanted to use Spring Framework, and you wanted to use a particular utility function that's in there, you didn't necessarily want all of the features, you just wanted to use a particular bit of it. If the Spring Framework shipped with the Web Fragment XML and you drop that into your web application, then that Web Fragment XML would automatically get deployed and you would automatically add potentially listeners, maybe servlets, maybe filters to your web application without necessarily realizing it when all you wanted to do was use that one particular library. So what Tomcat 7 will do is it will allow you to log the effective web.xml when an application starts. And the effective web.xml is the result of taking the main web XML for the application, merging in all of the fragments, applying all of the annotations, and then that, that's the end result. So by logging that, you're able to review it and see whether or not it is in fact what you actually want. Additionally, what you can do is you can then take that merged web.xml and use it within your application. And by setting the metadata complete flag to true, which will which it will be set that way in the uh, web.xml that's output in the log file, then that will basically stop Tomcat 7 scanning for any web fragments, any annotations or anything else, and it will assume that all the configuration information it needs is in that one web.xml. So what you can do is take advantage of fragments and annotations in development, but when you go into production, take the effective web.xml and use that explicitly. That way you get, the, you get the benefits of fragments and annotations, but without the potential security concerns in production. In addition to the web fragments and the annotations, you've also got more dynamic control um, via the programmatic interface. So this can be used by servlet context listeners, and it lets you do things like add servlets, add filters, add listeners, um, change the session configuration, um, set some initialization parameters, and set some security roles. So pretty much everything you can do in web.xml, not quite, but pretty much. And because it's programmatic, it gives you a little bit more control. And you can do things like, um, if, the if an environment variable is set that says this is development, then you could set up your configuration one way. If that environment variable says it's reduction, then you could set it up a different way. You could, if you needed to do um, operating system specific things, not that you should be doing that in a web application, but if there was a reason that you did, you could test what operating system you're running on and do one thing or something else. Um, if you wanted to do some JVM specific things, then again, you shouldn't really be doing JVM specific stuff. You should be using a standard Java APIs, but um, sometimes some of those extra features are quite useful and people do want to use them. So you can check whether that's available and then potentially take advantage of it. So we mentioned that under sort of programmatic control, you had more control of sessions, and I just wanted to expand on that a little bit. Prior to Servlet 3, so in Tomcat 6 and earlier, the mechanisms for session tracking were cookie-based and URL-based, and it was a specification-mandated requirement that the container supported URL-based tracking. Now, people have had security concerns about that, mainly because it puts the session ID into the URL, which in turn means the session ID is visible in log files, both at the uh, end server and on any intermediate proxies. Now, there are, there are ways to handle that, but it, it's, it's a valid concern that people do have. So in Server 3, you have much more control over the session tracking methods available. It adds the ability to bait, track the sessions based on the SSL session. Um, that has huge advantages from a security perspective because it makes it almost impossible for 
attacks like session hijacking um, and session fixation to take place. Now, in fact, for them to work, there would have to be some serious vulnerability in, in the SSL protocol, which is pretty unlikely. So they should be you know, significantly more secure. But you can also, if you choose, say, no, I just want cookie-based tracking. Um, if you do choose SSL session-based tracking, by the way, it has to be that and that alone. Um, you, can't, you can't have fallback options. Whereas with the URL-based and the cookie-based tracking, you can say, okay, I want to use one of them primarily, and if that doesn't work, then I'll fall back to the other one. Where you're doing session-based tracking via cookies, then you have a lot more control over the settings for that cookie. You can change the name, so you are no longer bound to using J session ID. Uh, you actually had that feature in Tomcat 6 as well. It just wasn't part of the specification. All of these things I'm talking about here are actually part of the spec. So you can also change the domain, the path, all of, all of those attributes there. Note there's a number of them that can be overridden by Tomcat. Um, particularly the secure attribute will be overridden if a cookie needs to be marked as secure. One of the attributes there was the HTTP only attribute. Again, there's support for this in Tomcat 6, but it isn't part of the spec. As of Tomcat 7, it's actually part of the specification. And the HTTP only flag, when add to, added to a cookie, tells the browser, and this works with all modern browsers, not to make that cookie available to script. So what that means is that if an attacker performs a cross-site scripting attack, what they usually after is the session cookie. If the session cookie is marked as HTTP only, then the cross-site scripting attack isn't going to get hold of the session ID, and it renders it pretty much useless. There, are, I mean, there are other things you can do with it as well, but it goes a long way to um, reducing the impact of a cross-site scripting attack. There's also um, the file upload features. The, the API for this is very similar, although not exactly the same as Commons file upload. And if you want an example of how to use it, it's actually now used by the Tomcat Manager application if you want to upload a WAR file for deployment. Finally, there's programmatic login. Now, this is useful if you're creating a new user account. What you'd have to do if you were using a sort of a pure server specification approach in the past would be to uh, give a user a form where they can create a new username, specify the password. You'd then have to insert that into whichever realm you were using and then redirect the user to a page that required authentication and get them to enter their username and password in order to log on. Now, that's a little bit cumbersome because you first ask the user if they use name and password then you redirect them to a page where they have to type it again to, to log in. So what Servlet 3 lets you do is actually take the username and password that the user's provided you with and just log them in programmatically. So it just lets you give that slightly smoother interface when um, cr creating new user accounts and the like. So that's a quick run through what's available in Servlet 3.